excited. Who loves Q&As? Anybody in here? Uh, I love Q&A. I think uh, sometimes you don't just need a prepared message, but you need to hear from somebody's heart and uh, getting to hear kind of the raw and candid conversations that follows from Q&A. Uh, I love that kind of stuff. So like Kevin said earlier, uh, if you have some questions uh, that you have specifically for your ministry, uh, I can tell you for sure, we're going to get into it in a minute. These two are some of the highest level leaders on the planet, and I kid you not, and I'm not just biased, but uh, I've seen it, and it's produced by great fruit from their ministry. Uh, both of these guys are my pastors. Um, they have had the greatest influence on my life personally, and I was a screw-up back in the day, okay? And so if God can, yeah, thank you, Justin. If God can change a young man like me, he can change anybody, and uh, I want to kind of talk about uh, kind of their personal story and a little bit of their personal story and their ministry story. So I'm going to pass it off to Dad real quick. Can you give us a little lowdown of maybe this church, your development, your call of God, um, all that good stuff? First of all, hello, everybody. How we doing? Glad to have you here. Um, we love hosting and uh, facilitating connections. And I hope you guys, more than information, I hope you guys have some interaction with each other. You know, I've really found that people... Uh, you get information and sometimes in one ear out the other, but if you interact, then you, you're able to collect and hold on to, like Velcro, the information you receive. So the relationships, there's, there's, more, there's just as much to be gained this way than there is from us to you by far. So I just want to encourage you guys, connect you know, after the sessions this afternoon, meet the people you met with, maybe hang out with, get, get, get somebody's email, stuff like that. So please, please, please do that. We're here facilitating that. Um, my story, where do I begin? Um, I feel like I was called when I was 15 years old. Uh, I heard, I really kind of heard that God wanted me to go into ministry when I was really young. I used to have dreams about being like in a situation like this and preaching to people. Um, I, I grew up in the home of an atheist. My father uh, is a converted atheist. He had this little phrase. He used to say, I was a wife beating, camel smoking, bourbon drinking, two-fisted atheist who got saved. And so I kind of grew up in a home of abuse and kind of crazy, and then he found Christ um, in an effort to try to disprove who Christ was. He found Christ, and I grew up in the middle of the before and after of my father. So I saw him when he was crazy for the world and sold out to the enemy, and then I saw him when he was crazy and on fire for God. So in the middle of that, I had to kind of find my own way. Does that make sense to anybody out there? And so... Um, you can't, God has no grandchildren, he only has children, so I kind of had to find my own way with God, and, and I came to Christ in an early age decision, uh, but disciple really later, and, but at 15, I heard God speak to me about getting into ministry, I accepted the call, really when I was about 23 years old, I went into Christian education, we, used to, we have a Christian school, uh, one of the things that uh, connect uh, overseas is a private Christian school, my wife actually runs that. If anybody's interested in info on that kind of a thing. Um, but I got into Christian education. That was kind of my entry point to ministry and then also worship. Um, so I was, I was uh, I sang at my sister's wedding. First time I ever sang in public was at my sister's wedding. And uh, one thing led to another, and I was up here leading worship. Did that 14 years while I was in Christian education uh, at the same time. And Christian education became a discipleship for me when I was discipleshiping, discipling young people. And I, I, I just got to, uh, I'd be in a, this room, actually. Uh, the, all the teachers would leave the room, and they'd leave me in the room to do chapel with ages 5 to 13. How many know that is a death sentence? All right. <laughs> Who does, uh, anybody do middle school ministry in here? God bless you. God yes. bless you guys, for real. So I had to kind of. You know, I felt like gladiator. I wanted to throw my sword at them and say, are you not entertained? And uh, because they weren't. But uh, it, was, it was painful, and I just had to learn how to um, communicate, learn how to disciple, and they'd ask questions just like we're doing today and come up with answers. But it ended up being an incredible training ground for me um, in, in ministry. And then after that, skipping ahead, um, I'm also the, you know, we're, there's three generations represented in our church. My father is the founder of this ministry, I followed in his footsteps, and, and now my son's a third-generation full-time minister in this ministry. But there was friction between me and my dad in transitioning to the senior pastorate. And I know that I'm going to, you know, hit people with that you're either in the middle of that, you're on the front end, the middle, or maybe some of you, unlikely, but on the back end of that. Um, but we had a lot of friction. So there's a founder, 
son relationship, father son relationship, and it was bumpy. And we um, we used to have some, you know, we call them brujas, but just like just. I don't even know how to say it, brawls, you know, verbal brawls. Um, and uh, one time we were here in this room and we were having an argument and uh, I had a lot to learn through this process about honor and authority and, and not being an Absalom, but I also had to learn how to have tough conversations and still fulfill the call of God in my life. And, and that's something that we can talk about, so I'm just kind of seeding you with questions that you can follow up on. But I can remember one occasion we had a big brouhaha up here and uh, the school was going on downstairs, and so the administrator could hear us yelling at each other. And so she went down the hallway and called a audible recess. And so she went into every classroom and said, everybody, it's recess time, it's recess time. And the teacher's like, no, it's not. It's, I got stuff to do. And they're like, no, 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 it's recess time, it's recess time. So all the kids are excited. They got everybody out of the building just because we were having a big bruja upstairs. And, uh, and so it was that kind of a thing that I had to work through with, with my father to get to the point where there was a release, uh, to get to the point where there was uh, health, uh, to get to the point where the call of God was actually able to be, you know, fulfilled and manifest. And that was a process and that was a journey for me. And we've been able to successfully navigate that. My father's retired. I've been the lead pastor for 15 years of this, this church as well as uh, other ministries and uh, it was a journey. It was a journey, and I love to talk to you guys about that kind of stuff. So that's a short that's clip from me from there to here. Uh, Jay, want to give us uh, your story? Yeah. Justin Daly, uh, Action Church right outside of Orlando. Um, grew up in the church. Uh, I think at, uh, as fast as you could get there, I was there. I think five weeks old, uh, born and raised. Uh, never really wanted to be there, uh, but I was there. Anybody been there before? Sunday night. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night in church, uh, didn't really uh, like what was going on, slept through it. And what I know now um, as a pastor is the pastor can see people in the seats. I always thought there was like a veil. I was second row, like 17 years old, just out cold. And, uh, and now I can see everybody, and I remind my church every single week, and uh, God is repaying me with some sleepy teenagers <laughs> in my church. But I'll just call them out. I'll be like, hey, bro, you should get a nap or go somewhere else because this church is exciting. You should not be asleep. And so um, grew up in the church, uh, fell, uh, fell in love with the Lord, recommitted my life at 19 uh, at Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, Alabama. It's this and, really um, minuscule, small church in Alabama yeah. of about 100,000 people. Um, yeah. So I think yeah. they're actually like 40,000. About 40,000, right? yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's a small little place. It was under 1,000 back then, uh, just a small church plant in a high school. And, uh, and I, I walked in, uh, recommitted my life, and, and felt the call to ministry that Pastor Derek was, was talking about. And did their school of ministry, hated it. <laughs> uh, I was like, man, I, I, like the, uh, I like what I saw from the outside, but ministry is a lot of work. And so uh, if you're getting into ministry to, uh, to be famous or cool or insta-famous, uh, that's not what it's about. And so I quit after a year. Um, I did school of ministry for a year. I was like, this is, this is for the birds. I'm out. And so I went into business, uh, started a couple of businesses at 21, and uh, was living that life. And here, here's where I got to. My wife and I bought our first home, had bought two cars uh, at 21 years old, and we were having this conversation, and we bo both felt this void of, we're going to get to the end of our life and have to answer the question, what, what do we do with the gifts God has given us? And this wasn't it. Uh, and for some of you, being in business or being a business leader and giving to the church and serving the church is your calling. But for us, we couldn't. Uh, we, we couldn't run that path anymore. We were going to be miserable in success because just because you're successful doesn't mean you're in the will of God. And we were being successful at the wrong thing. And uh, so we, 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 we sold everything. We went from a nice house to an apartment, from two nice cars to one not so nice car. And uh, we started our journey in ministry in Bradenton, Florida, uh, leading a school of ministry uh, for about five years for a great church down there, Pastor Randy Bazette. And we did kind of everything there in the next gen world. We did kids and students and young adults and that's where I met Devin, and I don't have enough time right now to share some stories, but after, I got some great stories for you uh, if you ever want any, any dirt on your pastor. Um, man, I got some stories. And, uh, We're saving them for fundraisers. I'm saving them, okay. <laughs> and uh, so I was there for five years, and I felt the call to, to plant a church. Uh, two years before I left, I had a conversation with my pastor, and, uh, and I said, here's what I'm dreaming about, and I just put it on his desk. 
uh, uh, really uh, in his lap and said, you, you, you guide me through this, you lead me through this. I think there's something important to that. If you're a young leader talking about your next season ever, it's, it's to honor and submit to your spiritual authority. And so I said, here's what I want to do. What do you think? And we went through a two-year journey getting ready uh, to, to, to hand off what I was overseeing there uh, well and then launch Action Church. And then in 2013, August 1st, we moved with 30 adults to the Winter Springs area, about 45 minutes from Disney for a perspective on the northeast side of Orlando. And 31 adults turned into uh, 82 adults on our launch team. Uh, and then January 26th of 2014, we launched Action Church with 714 people uh, in attendance and, uh, and we've seen about 3,000 people get saved over three and a half years, um, launching our, our third location uh, next weekend uh, in the Sanford area. Today, I've been texting. If you saw me texting, I'm not, I'm not distracted, but I kind of am. We're giving away uniforms. We adopted the worst school in our city, the poorest school in our city, and we're giving away. They have 700 students, and our team is out today giving uh, uniforms, as many as they need, to all 700 of those kids in elementary school. And... Uh, and we're just, just grateful, grateful to be called by God, grateful to be a part of, of what he's doing uh, in Central Florida, and, and just super excited to, to be here today to hopefully share some, some wins, but maybe even more important, some of the things that, that we screwed up so that you don't have to do the same thing, and we can learn together and hopefully leave here and, and help build uh, the only thing that, that God is interested in building, and that's, that's the local church. So happy to be here. Let's, uh... Check, check. Let's, uh, let's talk about your screw-ups, Justin. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But for real, let's talk about what I think uh, my generation and younger generation misses a lot, which is honoring authority. And obviously, there's a streamlined thought in both y'all's stories. Um, I would love to kind of share, uh, you guys to share some of the things you see about the younger generation, especially when it comes to honoring authority or not honoring authority, and how uh, important it is for their own personal destiny and calls. So, uh, Dad, want to want to kind of extend that thought and talk about um, your journey in honoring uh, my grandfather, your father, uh, and kind of the tough season you had to go through. Sure. Um, first of all, I think that this is my story, so it might not fit perfectly into your situation. Um, so you have to kind of contextualize it or adapt it to you. But hopefully, there's some ideas or principles in it that can be helpful. Um, you know, I think I knew that I was called to uh, be a pastor of a local church. Uh, for some people, I think they're called, uh, I, think, I think we're all, you know, called, but sometimes we're not all chosen to be the senior leader of that ministry. So just as an, out, just as an opener, I think a lot of people get in trouble because the culture they're in the exposure they have, they're convinced the only leadership position for me is the top level or top leader position. And so you set yourself up for disappointment and unmet expectations because you think you, the, the top position is the only position or the, the, the lead pastor, senior pastor is the, is, the, is the apex of your journey. And that may not be the case at all. I've actually got to, I've been in, in ministry over 25 years. And I know you're thinking, wow, he's really young. And you're right, I am. I'm young and good looking. Um, but, um, but in my experience, looking back, I've watched the evolution of the church. I've seen it explode with opportunities and new roles and responsibilities that have emerged and, and places of not success like he was talking about in the business world, but where people are really want not the dollar, but they want to make a difference. They don't really want success. They want significance. They're looking for significance, and significance is, only, is not only found in the top position, the lead position. In fact, it's not a very coveted position sometimes when you look at it. If you've got a really good look at it, you might think again. Yes, uh, that's true. It is very different than what many people think it is. So authority and responsibility are two sides of the same coin. So I want to have all the authority, but you have no idea how much responsibility you have with that, associated with that, that you don't have the shoulders for. So there's a lot of new roles that are out there, and if you will sometimes uh, open yourself up to relationships that God puts, sometimes they're right under your nose, but you're not pursuing them, you'll, you'll be able to see new lanes for you to make a difference or find significance. Is everybody tracking with me? And it may be your, 
your top position, your 10 area, and it also may be your portion. So everybody has a portion. I'm not going to have a Chris Hodges, I don't have a Chris Hodges portion. In other words, we all have a certain amount of ability or talent or whatever. You're either, you know, whatever you're one, a two or a five, whatever you are. I know I haven't reached my full capacity, but I don't want to compare myself to a Chris Hodges. You don't want to compare yourself to somebody else when your portion may be different than somebody else. You have to identify your portion, your capacity, and make sure you reach that in the lane that God has called you to reach it in, in the role that God's called you to reach in. Does that make sense? So I haven't even got into honor and authority and all that kind of stuff, but I'm just saying at the outset, a lot of times we're disappointed because we're looking at things through the wrong lens. Did you want to add anything to that? You can cut in if you want, so just feel free. Um, then I would say on um, personal mistakes, when I was going through that journey, I was sometimes looking at everything from inside a little bubble. And so I, I, didn't, I didn't know what I didn't know. I couldn't see what I couldn't see. So um, I uh, just thought that my father could prevent me from fulfilling the call of God on my life. And the reality is only I could prevent me from fulfilling the call of God on my life not my dad. And so a lot of times, like I was saying last night, I was looking up instead of leading up, and I didn't know how to honor authority. And this is a great separator, so if this will be one to remember. I had to learn how to separate honor and honesty. I had to learn how to have honor his position, but be honest and have crucial or tough conversations with my father in order to be able to move forward and fulfill the call of God and the path and, and the journey that he had me on. So the conversation shouldn't have been in this auditorium yelling and screaming at each other so every poor child down below could hear that. That's, criti- that's clearly not the answer, but, but nor was the answer just to grin and bear it, bury it and just put it aside like it didn't need to happen. Is everybody getting there? There was a plumb line between those two things where I had to learn how to, um, an approach is critical. You know, like there were some important things that needed to be said from him to me and from me to him. And we had to learn how to approach each other. If you think about a 747 that's trying to land, that that thing has to come out of the sky eventually because it's going to run out of fuel. It has to hit a certain destination. And so when that baby's flying, how many know the plane's got to come down, right? So it's going to come down, crash and burn, or it can come down the way it was designed to come down with approach being the top consideration on these itty-bitty wheels, on this itty-bitty runway, soft touch, soft landing. I'm going to be on a plane later today, and, you know, we all clap when the, when the pilot does a good job. God claps when we do a good job uh, in approach to the leaders that are over us. And if we lead up and consider our approach, God can elevate us or uh, bring us up to that next level of leadership in our lives. So I had to learn and separate honor from honesty, and I didn't do that well for a long time. And it slowed the process when I believe if I had accepted that, he would accelerate my destiny. So I think I slowed it up. I don't think my father slowed it up. So I think sometimes you think there's somebody over you and they're creating a lid on your leadership, but you're the lid on your leadership. And some of it's connected to honor, separated from honesty, and some of it's connected to approach, not just what you need to say or not say at all. That's pretty good. I only have one thing that... Um, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Oh, the thing that really stuck out is you forgot one when you said you were, uh, what did you say? You were smart and good looking and su- super humble. Oh, yeah, I think right. that you yeah, forgot exactly, humility exactly. in that one. Well, I figured my um, constituency. Is yes. Big. Humility. You guys run, pick that up humility well. runs really deep on this platform. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, can't, you can't plant something that you're not. And so I... I uh, I have the privilege to oversee and help art plant churches. And what you're talking about, honor and having to be the leader, I see so many young guys and young couples go try and start something that they're they're not. Like they say things like, I just, I don't want to do it this way. I don't want to do it that way. And they never figure out what they actually want to do. And I don't think if you you can't lead well where you are, you definitely don't want to go pursue more responsibility 
or authority. And so I see so many people tra transitioning from ministry to ministry or trying to accelerate their pace because they just don't want to do something as opposed to figuring out what they want to do, honoring where they are, and then waiting for God to release or promote or, or be sent out. And so I just think there's so much fruit when you plant intentionally, when you water intentionally, and you see something healthy grow, you can't, you can't say, I don't want to plant apples and get apples. And you, have to plant, you have to plant a seed, and you have to plant the right seed. And so just stop running from things. Uh, honor where you are, and I, I think God will bless it. If you guys need a resource, um, we both were influenced by a man named Billy Hornsby, and he wrote uh, a book called Leading from the Second Chair, I think, and um, a great book, Leading from the Second Chair. There's also another book. I think it's Clay Scoggins, the, the North Point guy. He's a campus pastor at North Point, and he wrote uh, how, to, how to Lead When You're Not in Charge. Fantastic book on, on just, like, how to create. One of the things I talk about is creating an oasis of excellence that increases influence where you are. So people think they need authority to be in charge. That's just a, that's a myth. You know, when I'm in charge, I'll be able to do da 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 No, it, nobody's really in charge. We all just have different levels of influence. So you just have to maximize the influence where you are and do a great job with that, and then God will give you more influence. I remember we were in a, a pre-op meeting in the back, and somebody asked Dad, he goes, PD, can you tell everybody that I'm in charge here? <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Can you, can you tell them to tell everybody I'm in charge here? And my dad just simply responds, well, that's the lowest level of leadership is positional leadership, John Maxwell's principle. And honestly, if you need to ask people uh, to, tell you, to tell them that you're in charge, that you just showcase you have very little influence. It's a myth. You're waiting yeah. for something. Because you think you need a title mm -hmm. when actually what you need is influence. Mm -hmm. That's what you need. Maximize your influence where you are. If God puts you in charge of a closet, maximize the oversight of that closet, and God will give you another room. And God can give you one person to be in charge of maximize the influence of that person, and he'll give you more. I mean, it, you know, there's something about this when Jesus said, faithful and little, God will give you much. It's the same idea. A lot of young leaders in the room, um, a lot of young people in ministry in the room. What do you think are some of the greatest strengths, greatest weaknesses of this generation of young leaders in ministry? Uh, Jay, why don't you go first? Thank you. Um, talking to a group of young leaders about what your weaknesses are. Hey, I'm Justin. <laughs> Very excited to meet you. Um, I think that um, the two biggest... Not you guys. Not you guys. You, the people that you lead. No, actually, we're teaching leadership. The first place you need to look is the mirror. One thing, let me just get off on a tangent real quick. If you have a problem in your organization, the problem is probably you. Um, and so we've just been talking about that as our team. As we've been, you talk about your team a lot. I don't like this. I don't like that. The first place you should look is probably the mirror because they're probably just reflecting what you've been teaching and leading. And so uh, we've been working on that really hard as our executive team and our staff. But the, the problem I see, uh, and it, this is not going to surprise you, but I, and I, can't, I can't really help you with it. It's, it's self-unawareness. We just don't have a very good picture of who we are and how we come across. And as I lead a lot of millennials and uh, our high school students, our young adults, how they think they are and how they actually are are very, very different. And, and how they treat people and how we talk to people uh, and how we even present the gospel uh, is, is different than we think that it is. And the second one would be uh, is awareness. I want somebody with, with very, um, that's very aware of who they are. And then second big thing at Action Church is, is attitude. A, uh, Pastor Chris does this. Uh, it's the, uh, the Tigger mindset. You know that? That's what Tiggers do best. Anybody didn't watch a little Winnie the Pooh? Like, you know, Tiggers, you know, whatever it is, that's what Tiggers do best. That's what we love at, at Action Church is I don't care what I ask you to do. It's that's what I do best. You want me to, you want me to go sweep the parking lot? Well, that's great because that's what Tiggers do best. You want me to lead worship? Well, that's great. I don't really sing that great, but that's what Tiggers do best. I'm in. Give me a mic. I'll go sing my heart out. I think as young leaders, if you can be aware and the key is ask God, who am I created to be? Back to your portion. And then have some people that can just say, that's not you. You're not good at that. Stop talking to people like that. Stop living that way. The best thing for awareness is accountability, and it's accountability that you ask for. And so be aware and then have a positive attitude. Everything that we get to do, especially if you're in ministry. If you were in here 
If, if you're a volunteer, uh, that's, that's amazing. If you're paid in here, I mean, the fact that we get paid on earth and in heaven to point people to Jesus is an amazing thing. And so uh, we should wake up every day saying, I get to take money to the bank and I get to store up treasures in heaven. Like, it's a pretty good deal. And so I'm just going to keep doing it day after day faithfully. That's what Tiggers do best. That's what I do best. Have a great attitude and be aware. I think God will, will, will release you into your potential. Real quick, can you tell them the other two core values of uh, action staff? Yeah. So our, our church, we have, uh, we have 10 reaction statements, um, uh, kind of a code of values for, for our church. So we have four for our staff. And uh, really, we've been around three and a half years. We've had to let go of three people, uh, or as we like to say, we stole from Andy Stanley, we freed their future. Um, and so we just set them up for their next season. Fired. That's what that means, y'all. <laughs> we fired them. Yes, we fired them. And uh, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't live these values. we got to be passionate followers of Jesus Christ. You can't give something away that you don't possess. And so if you're going to be in ministry, if you're not passionately in You love should with write Jesus, these down, by the way. This is a really good content. If you're passionately in love with Jesus, I, I, I gotta, you got to have that. Uh, two is a positive attitude. And these are in order of importance. you got to love Jesus. you got to have a positive attitude. You, you, you got to. I cannot do anything with anybody that doesn't think that we can do it. And so positive attitude. you got to practice teachability, which is not just yes, sir, yes, ma'am in the moment. Some of the, 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 the least teachable people I've ever met are the best in the meeting. But when you walk out, they never change anything, which means that they don't actually, they're not teachable. They just tell you what you want to hear. They're actually manipulative. And, um, and so we got to be teachable, practice teachability. And then the fourth one, we pursue excellence through hard work. And so I love prayer. I love worship. We've got to pray. We've got to pray first. We've got to pray second. It's not, a, it's not something that's just added. But, but in ministry, we've got to work too. Um, I sent a text yesterday. I didn't even share this with you. I was going to talk about it at lunch. A lot, of, um, a lot of my church planning buddies in the same season, we're finally getting to a place where we're not surviving anymore, um, where we've actually, you know, I actually could buy a house and feed my kids and do some things uh, that... Uh, but I watched them all summer, um, and they were all late 20s, early 30s, and they've been on, like, I counted a few of them, like, their fifth vacation of the year. And I texted some of my friends, and I was like, they wonder why their church isn't growing as fast as they want it to. It's because they don't do any work. You know, you got you to go to work. And so we're going to pursue excellence. There's time for rest and Sabbath. I get that. But there's also a time that you have to get up early, stay up late, and do some work. And so our fourth value is we pursue excellence, which is just getting better every day through hard work. Uh, Dad, weakness or strengths in millennial generation? Um, I think that you guys are great um, in connecting, but also very disconnected. So... Um, you know, your ability to be like just the whole social media thing, it has strengths and weaknesses. You guys hear this all the time, so I'm not going to go on a rant. Um, but, you know, you're so creative. Um, your ability to kind of get stories out and messages out and what's happening, obviously there's strengths to that. And we used to say this, you know, years ago, like TVs, you know, some people thought TV was good. Some people thought it was of the devil. And now it's social media. Is it good? Is it of the devil? It's good. It's just how we use it. So I see it being used in tremendous ways to advance the kingdom. And at the same time, I think it's created Achilles in, in uh, relational mobility, uh, our actual ability to be able to connect with people. You know, uh, John Maxwell, great, you know, leader, he, you know, he'd say, you can't ask for a hand until you connect with a heart. And so we're trying to increase influence, uh, which, of course, precedes affluence. So if you're going to be in ministry and you want to have means... You have to have influence before you have affluence. And so people don't have influence because they don't know how to connect with people on a heart level anymore. You can't do that across the table texting each other. You actually have to learn how to talk and, and actually be able to connect. And we live, you live more than I did in a permission culture. Uh, I, lived, I lived in a more submission culture. When the pastor said something, like that was it. End of story. Man of God said, X, Y, Z, we're going to go here. We're going to take the hill. We're going to do this, and you're going to do that. Like, there was no, like, find your fit. What's your 10? I want you to work in your strengths. 
You don't have to do that. You should be over here. Like it was, pick up a mop, son, clean the toilets, show up Sunday morning, lead worship, turn around, lock up the building, come back Monday morning, work all week long, drive me to the airport, pick me up at the airport, carry my bag, whatever. It was all that because the man of God said so. Come on, somebody. Tell them about the uh, the four week revival that we were just talking about yesterday. Oh yeah, we had we had revivals on this from this stage to hundreds and hundreds of people here, and the planning was two two men of God and they were men of God, so I shouldn't put that in quotes. I got to be careful. <laughs> Delete that. But the two men of God were up here on the stage. This is how this is. There weren't collaborative meetings, planning, preparation, but we'd have a planned week of revival meetings, morning and night revival meetings. And then the presence of God would come in the service, and the two men of God would get a witness and decide to extend the meetings another week, morning and night. That happened actually for four weeks in our church on the stage, and then the whole, we we didn't call it a dream team back then, we called it a slave force. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Delete that. Uh, The whole volunteer organization, which is a bad word in our church now, uh, just just did it because the man of God said so. The point is it was a submission culture, not a permission. So you're in a permission culture where you have to be almost invited into influence. And at the same time, it's diabolical. The enemy's gotten in there to to put a disconnect from our ability to be able to connect. So people want to be invited into that influence, but we don't even know how to do that. So that's a, there's strengths and weaknesses on, on both sides. Here's one more thing I think that you guys are great at, and also I think there's a weakness, and that is um, experience. You're really strong on experience. Like you want to you wanna feel something. You don't just do it. You don't just do things. Just do it. Like you don't just go to the gym because you just, you should do it. It's the right thing to do. There's a lot of things that, you know, I was just disciplined. And you know what? I found myself almost like an automaton, like a, like a robot doing things. And I'm like, I, and then I got to the point where I hated it. You guys realize there, there needs to be encounter. There needs to be experience. I want it to feel. But the flip side is you're, you can be very experience driven. And so you lose the discipline that precedes the character that precedes the encounter that you really need. So if you build everything on the mountaintop experiences, you're not going to be able to survive or overcome the valleys that you're in, inevitably going to have because you don't have the character or the, the fortitude in your faith to be able to survive that. So there's a daily walk that's lost because we're running from mountaintop to mountaintop. We're really just, we're kind of taking zip line from this top to that top instead of realizing that we're going to have to walk through this and then climb the mountain and then experience the mountaintop experience and get the full benefit of it. We just want to zip line from one mountain peak to another. That's a weakness that I see. I just thought of something real quick, what you said. I think it'll help perspective. If you're following, it should be a submission mindset. And if you're leading, it should be a permission mindset. Correct. And so when you were saying that, I was thinking, well, as we lead, we need, to, we need to lead by permission. My, my whole goal to witness to lost people, to preach from a platform, to lead the team is I need to gain your permission, the influence principle, so that, so that we can do this together. We need, I need to make you feel like we are in this together. The greatest leadership tip I could ever give you is to make people think it's their idea. If you will walk in a room, I'm not the best on the platform. I, I'm a six out of 10 preaching, but give me a whiteboard and a dry erase marker and a group of 20 people and we can all leave thinking it was their idea. I will have 20 people thinking, I, th- I came up with this. And they didn't have it, they didn't, I was 99% there. I brought it in and we were going the direction and now we're all going together. I gave them permission to buy into the vision. But then as we follow, it needs to be submission. Because if you have good spiritual authority and you, you put yourself under it, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna pick that place. God's going to plant you in a house, and if you will submit, I think you'll, you'll be blessed for it. So I was just connecting those. What, what, are the, what were the pros and cons of the former generation and now? I think that we, we need both, but we need them in different in how we lead and follow. That's so great. I think uh, something I see a lot of youth pastors and, and, and Caleb, we were talking about this a little bit too, is we see so many youth pastors or young leaders, they quit so quick, you know? I was uh, really talked off the ledge uh, when I was on the phone with Justin this one time because I came back from ministry college thinking I'm all high and mighty, got a degree. I have my uh, associates in, bat- in, uh, in Bible and theology, associates, two years, wasn't even four. And uh, I come back, I'm like, Dad, Dad's not got hiring me. I'm out. I'm out. I-, I don't know if I can do this anymore. 
And he goes, Devin, your generation quits in six to nine months, and you are notorious for that. You need to stick it out. And I am so thankful for that now. But what I find a lot of us, uh, we want to build something great, but we don't stay to build something great. We don't stay committed to it. And I think a lot of us, man, it's just, it's sad to see because we won't be able to see the the God-given dream that he's put inside of many of our hearts because many of you are visionaries, but you don't have the commitment, you don't have the fortitude to stick it out. And so I just think that's something we need to make a commitment to is really just three to five years. I'm planted here. I'm going to give God my, I'm going to give my pastor that amount of time. We can have a conversation afterwards after that, but it needs to be some years. Come on, there's faithfulness when it comes to this ministry thing. You got to, you got to sow uh, the seed. You got to till the ground. And uh, we're going to believe that God's going to do incredible things, but it's not going to happen through momentary uh, uh, serving. It's going to happen through a lifetime of serving. That's what's going to happen. I say something to that. Like, there's, there's a gap. There's an in-between a, a being anointed and appointed. So you guys know this from the story of David. You know, he was anointed at 13-ish, and then, but he was appointed at 30. And so that gap between, you know, do you know how many things that he had to go through that were priceless? We've been doing a series on David here at Connect, so it's fresh on my mind, but... That process doesn't have to be that long necessarily for everybody because I actually think we're in a generation where God wants to desperately accelerate our destinies. But I'm just saying you can't skip the lessons. You can't because you don't have the shoulders, as I was saying earlier, for it. God's preparing you to be able to wear the, the, the things, the mantle, that, the weight of that ministry upon you. So I remember being in the shower years ago, and I had been... Um, anointed, let's just say, to be the pastor. The, the, the language is obviously different, but just everybody knew it. it was public. This is going to be the successor, the first ever in the history of the church uh, to, uh, you know, this handoff was coming. And I can remember, there was about a two-year period where I was like, come on! And I'm just complaining to God, I'm complaining to my wife, and I'm just, and you know, I was allowed to speak but I wasn't able to make decisions, so I felt like a puppet. I felt kind of like emasculated. And, um, and then, um, you know, God was doing all these things in that process, in my character, uh, learning how to, again, not bury, but at the same time not be angry and be assertive and, and have these constructive conversations. But I remember one time being in the shower, and the, my installation had just happened. I was formally made the senior pastor. And I was in the shower, I was leaning against the shower, water's coming on my back. And Paul, God reminded me of the scripture where, where, where the Apostle Paul, it talks about all his hardships. You know, he was shipwrecked, he was bait, bitten by snakes, and you guys know what I'm talking about. He received the same lashes that Jesus did three different times, all that. And at the end it says, like, it, this is my paraphrase, but it's like, that's nothing because I had the weight of the churches on me. And God spoke to me in the spirit, in that shower, and he just said, right now I'm putting the weight of the church on you. And literally I felt like I was going to fall in the tub because I, it was like now I'm putting all the people, the responsibility. You wanted the authority. Here's the associated. It was the first time I was able to carry, and even then it was very hard. I was like, oh, that's what you were talking about. So I'm just, I'm just kind of cautioning you. Don't rush the process. Don't sit back and do nothing. That's not the passivity is not the answer. But at the same time, don't take the crown. Don't take the keys to the kingdom. Let, let them be handed off because there's a weight with that. And God is protecting you. He's not restricting you from that. I'm not following that. Yeah, yeah. Jay, how long have you been in ministry? Um, it'll be 12 years. 12 years. I've been in full-time ministry for 10. Let's, so uh, let's talk about that. And then uh, Kev and Richie, we're going to go around for some Q&A. Hopefully you guys have some good questions. Um, I'll go to Jay first and then Dad, you can go. How do you have longevity in ministry? Uh, nowadays, you see the statistics. I think for people that do what I do, I think, I, Caleb, what was it? Did they say nine months? Nine months was what Barna came out with recently? Is what the youth leader or youth pastor kind of lifespan is. It's crazy. I'm not sure what you lead pastors are. Do you know? Three um, months. No, yeah, right? <laughs> but it's very minimal. So how have you guys lasted over a decade? Dad, 23 years? Almost 25 years. 25 years? Mm -hmm. How do you have longevity in ministry? Yeah, I, I talk about it all the time, but when you're, um, 
the, the catchy phrase, the tweetable phrase is when, um, when your calling outpaces your character, uh, when, you're, when, you're, when your influence and your, your stage starts to outpace your, uh, your character, it's when you're really going to sacrifice what God wants from you. And um, I just think if we just, if we just love God and love, love our spouse and just stay faithful to the, the, the big rocks, the big things in our life, that, that God's going to help us build our church or build our ministry. I think when we get our perspective on the crowd or the results, um, and you've, you've, you've been in it much longer than me, you've seen, you've seen ups and downs. I know your story, and, and I don't know if it feels like this for you, if it's just mine, but sometimes the greatest attack is after the biggest wins, and sometimes actually the emptiest feeling is the afternoon after the best Sunday, and because it's just not as much about us as we think that it is. And so we did all of this work and we did all of these things and people are saying all these nice things and you just preach your best message ever. And then you just realize that if I was doing it for that, that I just missed it. And so I'm just reminded on a weekly basis that, that God's much bigger part of all of this than I am. And, uh, and then if I just, if I just love Stephanie, who's my wife of 11 years every single day, and I raise these two boys to be men of God, then, then the details of the church are, are going to kind of take care of themselves. And so uh, one, one thought I'll leave you with, and I'll pass it off to, to PD, is that um, in, in ministry and in your life, uh, do what only you can do, and then delegate the rest. And so I can only be a husband to my wife. I can only be the father of my two boys. I can be the lead communicator and vision caster and some of the other stuff that I would try and carry or take responsibility for, uh, I need to, to delegate to God because he's way better than I am and then to some staff members um, because we just we can't do it all uh, that we think that we can do. So, um, There's a practical part that I always want to run to, but I feel led to share a more spiritual thing that just came to me. Um, and that is, I think, well, in marriage, I've watched marriage Marriage is sabotaged. I've watched marriages under siege my whole life. Um, my, our own story, Stacey and I have had a, a rough start. We've been married 25 years. Uh, it's been 15 wonderful years. Um, and uh, she says a different number. Anyway, uh, so we have some math issues. There. But um, I just seen, I've seen, and so wh- one of the reasons that we've, we've been able to um, obtain a certain level of success and maintain it is my wife. My wife, she fights for us, not with us. So she's the, the major driver to the, to the cornerstone of ministry for us is marriage and family at Connect. This doesn't happen over time. It could, an event could take place, but no influence will take place if this is not good and this and the family dynamic is not good. So the platform is supported by the marriage and family. I'm getting somewhere. So one of the things that also helped us and I think needs to be eliminated in a marriage is the term divorce. And you guys know that, so immediately it clicks with you. But it doesn't click with ministry. In other words, you need to eliminate divorce from your vocabulary, from your heart, in ministry. In other words, the quit. The hit a certain spot. Ah, that's it. I'm out of here. It's not going to work. He's my problem. This is my problem. It's my structure. It's the place I'm in. It's the people I'm around. No, no, no. You need to eliminate divorce from your vocabulary. I'm not saying something couldn't happen where God would send you instead of you left. He might send you out. You might be able to have an amazing conversation that you never thought was possible where you get the blessing and you get the support or you get the release but you think it's them, but it's divorces in your heart. Divorces in your heart. So if you eliminate divorce, that spirit of divorce, I'm telling you, I think God can do something that sustains you and, and affects longevity, just like it did in our marriage. Many days we roll out of bed, we don't like each other. We love each other because we have to, but we didn't like each other. You know, as Devin was saying last night, we could be inches, just inches from each other, but miles apart. But we had a covenant. 
And we are not going to cut that covenant. We are, we are not going to break that covenant just because of a temporary problem or a situation that seemed insurmountable in the moment based on our feelings and circumstances and our own perception and our own uh, vantage point where we stand and where we sit, we think we're right. So eliminate divorce will help a lot. So that's kind of a spiritual side. I think it's huge. A lot I could say about that. And then practically, I just think longevity is related to uh, relationships and, and so I didn't get this right away. I think I made it this long on the grit of my father's example. My father didn't have some things I'm going to share in just a second, but um, I saw him just not quit. That had a lot to do with me not quitting when I would have or wanted to. Uh, so I credit him for that. He's just not a quitter. And so I'm not a quitter I just kept like, oh, I just got to figure this out. I just got to figure this out. So there's some of that. He did that in marriage. They've been married 50 years, 51 years. And um, I just, and yet, you know, they'll fight it out to the bitter end. Their marriage isn't awesome, but they're together. Praise God. You know what I'm saying? And I'd rather have them together still having some conflict than not together. And so I'm, I'm grateful for that example. Not everybody can say that. So you need to be the generation that sets a new standard. You need to be the curse breaker in your marriage and family and also in your ministry. Break the curse, eliminate divorce. But, but relationally, I think that um, what I learned later was that I needed fathers who spoke. In, this is what keeps men and women healthy. You can contextualize that. I'm going to use it for men. But I think you need fathers who can speak into your life, brothers who you have mutual edification. You can say anything. And then I think you need sons that you pour into. So what's made me think long term is I always have somebody that's just further down the road than me, way more perspective than I have, carries more weight than I do, but loves me. And there's a whole way to be a son to a father, which is another discussion. And then I think you just need brothers that you do life with, you hang out with, you can just be the real you. And I think you need people, if you want to stay healthy, that you take what you gain from that and pour it into. And that, I think, increases longevity. And all of that requires sacrifice and investment. And I haven't learned that, you know, to the fullest, but I'm, I'm learning it now at 49. So this is what it looks like going back to his divorce thing is this is my church. And I, if it divorces from me or I get sent out, but I got to get my pastor's blessing. That's what it looks like. And I just think that's so good. Almost Strive for that. It doesn't mean it's always possible. Romans 12, 18 says, if it's possible, as much as lieth in you. Live peaceably with all men. So that means, number one, you got to do everything you can do to have peace. Now, it has a two-letter word on the front of that that says if. What is the if related to? It's related to uh, the choice, the, the, the will of another person. You cannot control the will of another person. You can only exercise control over your own will, which is a muscle, by the way, that has to be disciplined. But so you can't control theirs, but you need to do everything you can. If you make that kind of effort on a consistent basis, it literally changes the dynamic of the relationship. You'll get different results. So it's heart and then it's attitude. And then I think it's actions uh, that will permeate the, the environment and change sometimes a lot of the outcomes. Yeah, I can say a lot about that. Uh, last question, and then we'll go to kind of an open forum. Um, can you guys share some stories uh, from the church that will build our faith? Like, uh, I don't know, just some awesome things that God did, some miracles in your church. I love hearing those kind of stories. It helps me so much. It just gives me kind of fuel to the fire. Anything pop off? I could share one if you want me to go first, even from last night. So it's really cool. Last night, uh, I received a word, I believe, from the Lord uh, on Tuesday. So it's just kind of uh, culminating and praying on that. And I believe the Lord told me that there was going to be uh, a girl and two men that were in the house uh, last night with an STD that I was supposed to pray for. So I share it. Don't see any response. I say, come find me after service. Uh, girl comes and finds me after service. And we're over there. My wife was with me. She tells me her name. She tells me she was raped at 11. She tells me she had an STD from that. And she's 16 years old. She told me. Uh, babe, what else was in there? She uh, is working three jobs right now trying to support her family. She hasn't been to church for months. Nobody in her church comes. And so what I really believe happened last night is we were laying hands on her and praying for her. And I believe she got healed from her STD last night. And so she's going to be sent back off. She's going to be sent back off. And I told her, we're going to get a good report from your doctor. 
And uh, we're going to get her connected to our local church. She doesn't belong to a church family. And so Natalia is going to be kind of investing in her a little bit. And so we believe that that's going to be a miracle that's going to take place. How awesome is that going to be? So that was just last night. And that was one of uh, many I could share. But you guys have anything? Yeah, I got a couple just, just from the summer. Uh, I was telling you all last night briefly that, um, and he talked about the, that it's not just a, uh, the word is, is meant to be preached, but there's also be a, d- a demonstration, and, and that's what he was talking about. And we had a, uh, just shared it last week in our church, we had a baby uh, that we've been on this journey with, uh, baby Aaron, uh, and at eight months, everything was healthy the first seven months. At month eight, the, the parents went in, a couple in our church, young couple in our church, and uh, they said there's something going on, had two conditions um, that was causing the, the brain to stop functioning. So the baby was going to be born and live 90 seconds to two minutes because the brain was not going to tell the lungs to breathe. Um, and so basically stillborn. And so we started praying every Saturday morning. Uh, our prayer team would get together and pray. The grandmother would come uh, and we were just praying. We decided that we were going to pray for a miracle, uh, but we were also going to be there for the family um, in case, in case God decided to, that he needed baby ear more than we did. So we sent a pastor, actually decided to get a C-section so they could have about three minutes uh, with the baby so they wouldn't have to go through the struggle of the birth canal and, and lose any time with, uh, with their little boy. And uh, so we go there. Uh, they had the C-section. Uh, we've been praying. Uh, the baby lives for two minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, two days, two weeks. It's actually going home this week fully healthy, and doctors, nurses, I mean, nobody has any explanation. I mean, we do, uh, obviously, that, that God performed a miracle, and then um, we talk about that, and those are amazing, and I think they're amazing because, um, because we get to give the glory to, to, to God, and so I even talked to the family and said, I'm, I'm so excited for you but I'm even more excited about the story that this baby has and you now have to, to build the kingdom of God. And so I just want you to know also that the greatest miracle that we see at Action Church, at your church, at Connect, is the miracle of people going from eternal death to eternal life yeah. and salvation. And so one more story. We had our first ever uh, student conference, and it was just for our students um, at Action Church. And on the last night, I gave an altar call for salvation, and, and we had over 70 students come forward to make a first-time decision uh, to follow Jesus Christ. And so uh, those are just two, two huge highlights from the, our past month at Action Church. Um, I'll share one. I got a bunch of them, but, uh, you know, I wish I could. There's some financial ones I'd love to share with you, but they could be misinterpreted. So um, I was trying to figure out how to shorten them. But I got one evangelistic one. I think sometimes we, I'm obsessed with people. I love people. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a pastor, pastor, you know, Evangelist is is kind of the two offices that I, uh, I, I identify out of the fivefold ministry the most. Um, another one developing, but um, when I'm out of the church, I'm always not always, but oftentimes, uh, you know, trying to connect with people. In fact, sometimes it slows me down a lot, and I'm trying to get to places and do things, and and so my wife will attest to that. Don't say amen. And uh, <laughs> like last night, I said, my wife will attest to that. She says, amen. Um, so anyway, I was out and about in, uh, in the town here, and I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to uh, text somebody. And I didn't have their phone number. All I knew was their, last, their, their first and last name, but I, did, I, I thought I might have the phone number. I didn't. I'm like, this person kept coming up on my mind, kept coming up on my mind. And I'm driving, and so I'm like, you know, I can't do it right now. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me to do something with that. Does anybody have something like this before? A person's name comes on your mind, and you're just not sure if it's a bad taco from last night or it's the Holy Ghost. And so I was in that place. It just got stronger. Long story short, I pulled over on Cedar Street here in Ashland on the side of the road, and I can't find this guy's number. So I I use Facebook like a glossary sometimes because, you know, you you can find somebody or you've accepted people you don't even know. You guys all do that, so don't look at me like that. And uh, so I look up this guy's name. Sure enough, he's, he's, on, he's on my Facebook. So I instant, me- or whatever, I message him through Facebook, and I just basically say something, hey, man, you're on my heart and mind. I was just thinking about you. I'm praying for you right now. I hope you're okay. Send. Boom. That's all I hear about it. Uh, later that day, I get contacted from what I didn't know was his sister. And his sister says, Pastor, you're never going to believe what just happened. Uh, right in that moment when you were messaging him, uh, he was in a garage 
the door shut, inside a car, and the whole garage was being filled with carbon monoxide. He was planning to take his life. And he thought he was going to receive, he was going to receive, he was texting people to tell them different things. I love you, I'll miss you, things like that. And you messaged him in the middle of that. And he changed directions. And that same guy called his sister and said, did you tell Pastor D what, you know, what's going on in my life? And blah, blah, blah. She's, he, doesn't, he doesn't even know we're friends. He doesn't even know we're family. That was God. And she was able to minister to him, pray with him, brought him to church. That same guy gave his life to Christ and got water baptized on this stage. All because of a text message. That's so awesome. I love hearing stories like that. Uh, your faith built up. That's awesome. Do uh, you guys have any questions? Uh, shoot your hands up. And Kev, where's Richie? Kev, Richie, we'll uh, I'll get a mic to you guys. Uh, let's utilize these guys' time. We have about 13 minutes left. So uh, shoot your hand up if you got a question. If you don't, I got a quick one. Good? Good morning, everybody. My name is Sam. I'm from XL Church in Lemister. Pastor Emmy, shout out, 978. Uh, my question... <laughs> My question is for Pastor Derek. I see your beautiful relationship with your son, and I can relate to you about your father because I share a similar background. Uh, my father is more of an agnostic, not so much an atheist, and he's an immigrant, and he came to this country to work hard. So I'm very thankful for the life he provided for me. So uh, he, his idol is work. And his idol was to provide for his family, where church and Jesus becomes secondary to him to the point where he questions everything. As a matter of fact, I believe Pastor Justin said, for the right answer, you have to ask the right question. So he, somebody said it, excuse me, but he questions everything very similar to Doubting Thomas. He wants proof. For everything, he scrutinizes everything. He questions the church, the authenticity, the integrity of scriptures, pastors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where it becomes uh, more like a theological debate. And I supplement the relationship that I never had with my biological father, with my heavenly father, because I know he dwells in me and walks with me every day and guides me. So uh, there's a huge dichotomy in my family. The more I do things for the community and sow seeds and reciprocate what I've been told to do by my Heavenly Father, the more the relationship with my biological father deteriorates and the more he'll mock me if I go to Bible study or whatever. And um, I know faith is very important. It's very central to being a Christian. I know in, in, in Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of what is hoped for and the evidence of things that are unseen. Even in the gospel, it talks about, in all the synoptics, that the house will be divided, father versus son, etc. My question is, how do you get over that, and what, what do you recommend, and how did you build that relationship that you have with your father now? Because it doesn't seem likely that I'll ever experience that. Um, there's a lot to that, so let me... You want to build a bridge with your dad, basically. You want to... He's not saved. Yeah, understood. Um, I think that um, the fact, as you, as you mature as a believer, the myth that you have to separate needs to be addressed. I don't think you separate because you get closer to God. I think because you're closer to God, you should be able to engage the culture and connect with people that are far from God better. So if you can change that mindset, God's going to give you wisdom in how to build bridges, make connections, find common ground, um, honor him, build him up, encourage him, add value to him. So sometimes when there's a breach in a relationship, this, this happens a lot of times with parents and kids. Um, parents did a bad job with their kids. They've lost the influence on their kids. What do, you, what do I do? What do I do? You serve your way back. You serve your way back in influence with your kids. I think you can serve your father in some way, capacity, shape, or form. It adds value. Um, you um, don't necessarily have to preach at him, but you can respond to him. And, um, 
And then I think, you know, you were kind of going down. I thought you were going to go here, but I think Pastor Chris has taught us as, as, as a spiritual father to both of us uh, to lead with questions and not with certainties. So sometimes we're so, the more we learn, the more certain we are about what we believe. But we really need to design and craft questions that are not critical, but they're critical thinking. There's a sharp razor's edge between being critical and being a critical thinker. And Christians are just as bad as the skeptics sometimes at being critical. So you've got to be careful you're not being critical of him, but you're being critical in your thinking in approaching him and design questions that can pull out what's underneath his apologetics, his arguments, his debate. Because really underneath that, he's, he's a wounded man, he's hurt, he's been beaten up, he's been let down by someone, maybe his own father. And if you can identify with those things and pull those things out, you might be able to get to the, the crux of the matter and be able to build a relationship that could ultimately lead him to Christ. You might not be that one, but don't get in the way of somebody else being that one by how you handle your relationship with your father now. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Joe from Connect PD, is my uh, pastor. Um, I just had a couple, uh, quick question um, for Justin on uh, submitting to authority and whatnot and what, uh, like a, one or two like practical steps that you do on a daily and a weekly. On, I know you're a senior pastor, but you submit to, you know, submit to God. And you, how do you go about that with some practical steps? I'm going to be preaching on it for about 35 minutes on Sunday at Connect at 8.45, 10.30, and 12.15. For real. I'm talking about honor. Awesome. I'm going to answer it. I'm going to answer it You did better than our MCs. Normally, yeah. we don't get this. Service, right. Well done. <laughs> Shameless plug for Connect. Now, I really am. I'm going to talk about it. You going to be here Sunday? Yes. All right. I'll answer it then. All right. Great question. Next. That's what you call a shameless plug. I don't have any books for sale, but if I did, I would hook those in right there, too. Chapter hey, 7. Hey, your hand up if you've got a question. Uh, I do have a question for you. Seeing 71 students give their lives to Jesus, uh, obviously you guys are doing something right in reaching the lost. How do you effectively reach lost people? How do you do that well? I just heard the best message I've ever heard on it, and I'm going to re-preach it at my church on August 20th. Um, so if you're in Orlando, you can come. Our church, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> 9, 15, uh, 11, 15. <laughs> yeah. Um, John Maxwell at Grow um, Conference just taught it, but he taught it back at Church of the Highlands on a first Wednesday at the beginning of the year. So just look up Highlands' website, and he talks about earning the right to share your story. Mm. And so much about the permission mindset, I just think that we build a community and we build relationship and we earn the right to share the gospel. I think right. the former generation was we preach the gospel and I'm not telling you to stop preaching it. I'm asking you to live a life that earns the right to do it. Right. And so uh, the groups, we, we set them up at this conference with small groups, tribors, conversations, the messages, the worship. Everything was earning the right to get to the last session to invite them to follow Jesus. And so we spent two and a half days and thousands of dollars to earn the right to present the gospel. And they responded. So earn, earn the right relationally to, sh to share your faith. So good. Deb, we've got a question back here. Hey guys, good morning. Uh, Tafari from the Connect Dream Team here. I just had a quick question, um, probably to Pastor Justin, just to touch on the, the discipline required to do um, not just leadership, but pastoral services, but um, what is that like, a day in the life of a pastor or a week in the life of a pastor? I had a chance to hang out with PD and Devin sometime and one in the morning they're writing sermons and yeah. going through stuff but yep. what is that like great. so that people understand the intentionality and the work behind it great uh, I was hanging out with a pastor you would you would all know shameless name drop Carl Lentz um, <laughs> and he I asked him before I planted the church I said what do I do with this balance of, of being a lead pastor? And he said, there is no such thing as balance. That I'm always, I'm always a Christ follower. I'm always a father. I'm always a husband, and I'm always a pastor. And so this family is on a journey. Um, and so I don't, I don't believe in balance. I just include all of my priorities, and I put those and let everything else fill in the gaps. But a day in the life of the pastor, Monday, I work in it, so I have meetings. 
Um, we have weekend review. I'm in the organization Tuesday and Wednesday morning. I study. Wednesday afternoon is any big picture or creative meetings. Thursday, I work on it, so I remove myself from the details. That's vision casting. That's meeting with top business leaders. That's helping ARC with church planning and coaching. Uh, Friday's off day. Saturday is family day. So Friday's my day. Saturday's my family's day until I put the boys down. Um, right after dinner, about 7 o'clock, actually, I'll study for Sunday and then preach preach all day Sunday. Um, so it's very calendar, but when the, when the, when the Spirit moves uh, with vision, uh, I've got a home office now, which I love, and so I'm very quality time with my family, but they go to bed earlier than I do. And so I'm very creative from about 10 o'clock to about 1 a.m. a couple times a week. I got a whiteboard for a desk that's huge, and I'll just be, I'll be working on finances, messages, vision. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's a day in the life. It's not very glamorous. It's a lot of work. How's it going, guys? Uh, I'm David, um, also part of Dream Team here. And uh, I guess this could be for all of you, but... Um, David, where are you? I'm right here. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll stand up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Got it? Um, no, but Pastor Justin, you made a great point earlier um, to do only what you can do and then delegate or empower the rest of it. And we're really big on empowerment here for health, longevity, and ministry. So I guess... For all of you, what would you say is like your biggest step in empowering? What's your 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 go-to, your your bread and butter for empowerment? Uh, Pastor Justin, you said that making people think that something was their idea was a big one. Um, do you guys have any? Yes, more? let it think. So mine's simple. I'll get out of the way. Uh, it's not mine. We stole it from somebody. I don't know who. I do. We do. You do. So you find somebody. I do it. You watch. We do it together. Uh, so if it's speaking, we'll give you, uh, like in kids, you, you lead the game, you lead core values. If it's our growth track, you say the, the prayer over the food. We're going to give you a little bit. We're going to critique it. We are going to do it together, and then you're going to do it, and then we're going to debrief. So I do it. You watch. We do it together. We talk about it. Then I give it over to you. You do it, and now you're, you're on, and I'm on to the next thing. So that's how we train all of our leaders. I do. We do. You do. <laughs> I'm laughing because we all have acrostics, so <laughs> I'm going to give you another one. Um, we try to move people through levels of leadership. So we start with see it, the see it leader, like try to identify, you know, is this a person that can identify what needs to be done? You walk in a room, you're like, oh my gosh, the chairs are a mess. Oh my gosh, you know, what's going on with these lights? There's a lot of people that can see it, but they stay at that level. They're kind of a monitor level. And then we try to move them to the fix it level. So the fix it level, these are the people that roll their sleeves up. Okay, I'm going to push those chairs in. I'm going to fix those lights. I'm going to make sure the temperature's right in the room. Those fix-it leaders are great, but there's a lid on a fix-it leader because you can only go so far in the organization if you only see it, if you only fix it. So we need to be able to move people to the lead-it level, and this is the empower part, and this is where really you start uh, getting momentum is when you're releasing responsibilities. So I think we need role descriptions or responsibility descriptions for people, not job descriptions, and let them know what they're over, not just what they're in. Uh, and that should hopefully include themselves and people, um, so that lead it level. And then the true sign of success is when they can leave it. So for me, I feel better about myself. when I, Like I've been out of the pulpit for a couple of weeks, three weeks. I'm going to be out of the pulpit quite a bit in the next few weeks. Um, for me, I used to freak out over those kind of things. I could never leave. Uh, that was a sign of a leadership weakness in me. But when you can leave, you can walk away, and the thing continues to grow. It's healthy. It's moving forward. That's going to give you uh, the motivation to do a better job on equipping and training and empowering if you can see those different levels of leadership. So your job is to figure out where you are in those levels and continue to move down the chain, if that makes sense. So it's I do, we do, you do. See it, fix it, leave it, lead it. Or lead, lead it, it, leave it. Right. Yep. I would say receive, achieve, believe, <laughs> read, heed, I need, um, and that's mine. Hi, my name is Jess, and Connect is my home. Hi, Jess. Hi. <laughs> I have a quick question. You meant, one of you mentioned that young adults tend to give up within six to nine months. My first question is, what is the root cause? And what are some steps that you would take to get out of that um, feeling of breaking down or giving up? You get it? You got it? You get it? I'll go quick and you can go. 
Um, I don't like to go after him because he's smarter and wiser and he has so many tweetable phrases. I wish I had my phone up here. I would have sent out like 17 tweets so far. Um, I think people leave for two reasons. People leave our church, our organizations, um, because it didn't turn out the way they thought it would or their role in it didn't turn out the way they thought it would. So what we were going to be a part of, this, this vision, being a youth pastor of this church, I thought the church was going to be here, and then six months in, the church doesn't look like I thought it would look like. Or my part in the vision doesn't look like I thought it would. And so I think, how do we get away from it? We set clear expectations up front. I think a lot of times we have better conversations before we jump into a position. And then to Devin and Pastor Derek's point that we just, we just commit. Once we commit, we commit. Um, so have all the tough conversations up front, you know, the whole hire slow, fire fast. If you're going into position, interview where you're going to. I mean, really, really understand what you're stepping into. What are the expectations? What is the vision of the house? Understand what you're signing up for. But once you sign up, your name's on the line. I'm called to do this. And so I think it's a commitment after that. Um, my name's uh, Robbie. I'm from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I guess my question is, I was watching uh, something on Facebook, and it was like uh, a pastor, he was talking about um, being part of a big church. And uh, basically there was this kid, and he was in a gang, and he ended up getting saved, got baptized. And after he was baptized, um, shortly after, like after a couple months, he ended up uh, leaving the church. And when they asked him why he left the church, they said, he said because he thought once he got baptized into the church, it was like him getting, like how he was with his gang, like getting jumped into a gang and now they're a family. And when he left the church after being baptized, uh, he was expecting to have that like family environment. But I guess his church didn't do a great job of having that family environment of somewhere where he could come and like really hang out and like, uh, really have like brothers and sisters and have it like a family environment. So I guess what my question is, what do you guys do to like create like a family atmosphere for like uh, people that are just being saved and stuff like that? Oof, now we're getting into it. Now we don't have time. <laughs> I wish I had a whiteboard right now. Um, so does Justin. But um, we, if, you know, we're trying to take people on a journey ultimately, you know, um, and alliteration coming. We're moving them from the street, not just to that seat, but we're trying to get them to significance. And in that process, they're in different layers of relationship. So they've got this community, you know, circle. We're trying to get them into congregation. Um, and... And so we get them into the church, and you know we want to identify what it's how the importance of sitting under the word. But that's where a lot of churches stop; they just live for the weekend, for the event. That's that's the that's the mistake. Um, so from there, we're trying to get them to small groups. So I won't get alliterative, but I could. Um, it's a disease, and I need prayer. Um, so we're trying to get them into small groups. But small groups, even that, sometimes people think that's like the end point. But it's really the entry point for what God really wants is because out of that small group, there's hopefully going to be a place where people can find two, three people, at least one, where we know each other inside the guts of us. That we've, we've, you've come out, here's, here's the real me, the naked truth about what's going on in my life. That's where transformation comes. My biggest breakthroughs, lid lifter moments, defining moments in my life, certainly there were times where it was just me and God, but most of them was me and another person that God used. And so I, um, I want to create environments where that can take place. And that's what we're doing as a church. So on the side, you can talk to some of our leaders and see like what we do to take people on that journey. But we have methods behind every one of those things. So every circle of relationship is pointing to a smaller circle with the goal of getting real with a person. Can we just put something to like when Jesus met with the woman at the well, he said, go and sin no more. He gave her some ownership. Can we put some ownership on that guy? 
that there probably was a church that loved people and had a system that he didn't choose to be a part of. Right. And so, so many people that leave our church wounded and offended, I ask them, what team did you join? What step did you stop at? What group did you go to? I didn't go to any of them. And so it's the whole deal. You haven't called me. And it's like, do you got, you got a cell phone? Like you haven't texted me either. And so, so I want to, we, as a church, we need to have systems that people are needed and known. They know that we, we need them and we know who they are, but, but they also have to take that step too. And so we can't, we, we can't take ownership for people not wanting to. Did you hear what he just said too? A little sidebar. Two big things people want. They want to feel needed. So the debate, what does that mean? I want to make a difference. That's what people get up. They're like, what gives them fulfillment is I made a difference in somebody's life, you know? And I try to do that on a daily basis. I have this rule of five thing that I learned a long time ago, but make a difference in somebody's life every day. It could be the smallest thing. Push some old lady's golf cart, not golf cart, grocery cart. <laughs> or golf. Where are you hanging That's out? That's very specific. <laughs> That's my caliber of golf. <laughs> old ladies. Um, <laughs> But, but there's the make a difference. And then there's, you know, you want, people need to feel known. So there's that sense of belonging. And so that can happen without structure. It better with structure. But if we can eliminate the victimization of, well, we don't have that. And I, nobody came to me and nobody called me. Have you, were you a friend? Did you take anybody to lunch? Are you evangelizing and reaching out and making new friends? Are you doing something to change the environment from where you are? So, again, we have systems for that that work. And, and so does Justin, um, and we can identify that, but I agree 100%. A lot of times it's just, again, personal responsibility. We got, we got time for one, two quick questions, and we're going to pray together. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Felipe. I'm from Excel. Um, I love to ask this question every time because I feel like the more answers I can get for it, the better I can be in my journey. Um, I'd love to know, you guys, before you guys were in full-time ministry, obviously you had to balance, you know, wife, life, work, and ministry at the same time. So I'd love to hear some tips on doing that. You know, I love to serve, I love to be part of the church, but I also have a life that I have to take care of. And the reason why I love to ask this, and, and I know last time PD gave some, some good stuff from Craig and trying to apply that every day, but I'd love to hear from, you know, everybody balancing life and ministry and, and being healthy in that. So. I, I, already, I already talked about it. I talked about that you, you don't get to say no to any of those. The ones you just named are, are who you're called to be. And so every single day I have to figure out how I individually love my boys because they're two different humans. I have to figure out how I love my wife and how I lead my church. And whether I'm here today, I'm going to FaceTime both boys today. I've already texted my wife, um, and I've already checked in on my church, and I'm still doing this. And so there is no balance. I just, I am everything today. And so every single day, I need to make deposits in the importance. So I've texted my executive team, who's leading the outreaches today. I'm going to FaceTime my boys this afternoon, and I've texted my wife, and I'm going to fulfill my personal call here to teach and to preach. And so I don't, there is no, there's no balance. I, I I can't, I can't balance it. I've just got to be it. It's more rhythms and seasons and things. You know, he's got a young family. He's in a different season than I'm at with, an, with older children. And so there, there will be ebbs and flows. But a, a thought for you, which he already said about Big Rocks, is you, most people are prioritizing their schedule, and they're not scheduling their priorities. Mm. So just identify your priorities and schedule those. And everything else will, won't fit in. You won't, it won't all fit in, but at least you will have done the most important things. And that should include your devotional life, your time with God. It should include loving those closest to you. I think it should include making a difference. I think it should include loving people, you know, close to you. I think it should include taking care of yourself. That should be, a, those, those things should be in your priority list. And you'll go to bed every night. I have stuff undone every single day of my life, a lot. But if I'm living my priorities, man, life's a lot better. So the question, the question is, um, so my name is Brandon. I'm from Gethsemane Pentecostal Church here in Framingham. Um, it just popped in my mind, so I might not word it properly. But um, Devin, you said that, Pastor Devin, you said that, um, you know, for youth pastors or those dealing with young adults, the time span is usually six to nine months. Um, and uh, a cause for that might be like a lack of mentorship. 
or someone that you could speak to. So how do you guys, um, like, if you can just touch on the importance of mentorship and how do you kind of get mentorship? Like, how, is it simple? Like, it might just be simple. You just, you know, hey, can you be my mentor? How do you go about that? So these are my two mentors and these are my two pastors, and I adamantly seek them out regularly, and I've become... Uh, okay and taking responsibility for it, they're not going to be responsible to seek me out. Mm. If I ask them to be my mentor, what I'm asking is, can I pursue you and are you okay to pick up a phone call every once in a while? Can you, Good. Can you talk about how often we talk to, because this is, I, I need to speak like 30 seconds once you're done, but can, how often do we, I'm your, I'm your mentor, second to your dad, I would say. like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we talk on the phone, we have a regular meeting every other month for about 30 minutes. Yeah. So I think it's, if you want a mentor, seek out a mentor, and you keep seeking them out. Just like, just like you get married, you just keep dating your wife when you're married. That's what it is with a mentor. You keep finding them, keep pursuing them, because they got a lot of stuff that I need and I want, but I'm not waiting for them to come to me. Make sense? Because you ask for a mentor, not a best friend. And that's what my biggest pet peeve with my young church is, is that so many people want to be like, can you mentor me? But they just want to, what do you want to talk about? I just want to get to know each other. I don't have time for that. We've got that systemized. That's called a small group. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and even Devin, I love Devin. Like one of my top 10 favorite people in the world. If he called me for 30 minutes and we just hung out, like we need to set that precedent. Because this, you, you said you wanted a mentor, you better call with some questions. Like, let's have a conversation that edifies you and helps me and we can learn mm. together. And so one thing for pastors in here, and I don't know if y'all may do this too, I don't, I don't mentor anybody, but I do lead a small group. And so a lot of these conversations are, hey, you want, you want to be mentored by me. There's going to be 30 of us. I'm going to provide breakfast. We're going to teach. We're going to pray. We're going to do all these things together. Just because life, the big rocks, mentoring one-on-one, -on -one, the masses from my church, it is not a big rock for me. We have that systemized. We have pastors and small group leaders. But taking great care of young leaders is, and so I have a system for it. It's a small group. It happens every Thursday at 630. I'm going to be there. You want to be in a relationship with me? You can be there as well. That's good. Um, another. <laughs> is that, too, is that, 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 that awesome. nice enough? Sorry. That was awesome. I got, the, uh, I got these two are comfortable my mentors. And in case you couldn't tell, Justin's very straightforward. He's a truth talker, and as is dad. But, uh, but we need more people like that because so many people in ministry, uh, we are so flowy and we are so hippie that we never get things done. We're wasting time. We I are. think people think we have, there's so much time. There's so much time, even between me and my son. Um, so, first of all, I'll say to Devin, he finds a place of common ground. So, we share a lane. And so when we share a lane, then we can, we can do more of this. So he comes to work out with me. So, and that, it's, he comes into my space. So just as a thought, if you want that kind of a thing. And, and, and then you, he drills me with questions. He's got tons of things to talk about, always has an agenda and is prepared. By the way, with my mentors, I do the same thing. I was just sharing, you know, call up Pastor Chris. You better have some stuff written down because you got 15 minutes. It, now, how much and how often does that happen? I need more frequency. I don't know that you need frequency. You need quality. Do you want somebody available just like sitting on the side of the road? I can mentor you, man. If you need something, I'm here. I'm here all the time. I'm available. I'll be a mentor. Like, I can't believe how many people want to be life coaches. I'm going to go off on a little <laughs> diatribe right here, but I'm going to be a life coach. You, you're not, you need to coach yourself. You need therapy. People are going into <laughs> life coaching. Life coaching, you need to be coached. Like for several years, now you're going to do this as a business because you have all this time because you haven't been successful. Andy Stanley says limited, more success means limited access, okay? But with that limited access, you get way more from it than you would from somebody with no success and total access. And simplify it. 15 minutes with one of these two is 100 times better than a couple hours with just a regular leader follow me yeah. so i am so, so grateful be, yeah, I know. the biggest thing that i've learned and and i so let me soften this i really love you and i love people I know, I know. So <laughs> you know you can't tell from our two hours together but it's we we are so educated beyond our level of obedience that i can only i can only accomplish like if i ask pastor chris two or three things i've got some stuff to work on so what else do we need to talk about until I go work on the two or three things that you just gave me? And so we want to talk about it. 
and we want to keep talking about it, and we want to ask 17 people about it. No, I'm going to seek the Lord. I'm going to seek wisdom from spiritual authority, and then I'm going to go make some changes. We want to pontificate the idea and the strategy and the methodology of how we're going to get better instead of just taking a couple of simple thoughts and then go spending that time getting better. And our whole life, and yours should be too, should be thinking, you know, our pastor says, life's not a dress rehearsal. It's the real show. We got one shot. So you're trying to make the most of it. I have less years of both these guys. And I, every, every year that's left, I'm thinking, how do I make the most of the time that I have, the opportunity that I have, as the Bible says? So I can't help everyone. I can't spend time with everyone. So I have to think very strategically, very calculated, very predetermined, what is the best use of my time? It's to be with leaders. Okay, well, now of those leaders, now I have to think about who are people that are following, literally obeying, making a difference, making an impact. That's the best use of my time for the kingdom. Even though personally, I'd love to hang out. My wife and I have some friends that we used to hang out with years ago. We don't hang out with anymore. Not because I don't love them. In fact, we really enjoy them. We would love to go on vacation with them, do life with them, all kinds of stuff. But they're not, they're not about the kingdom. So we had to make a disconnect with some of those things. So I've got to have people who are very kingdom-minded in my lane, or there's going to be a limited access to that. Does that make sense? So it's not a personal thing. It's not I don't care about people. I love people. In fact, I struggle with it. I, I struggle with this for years. So now I've had, to, I've had to be much more disciplined and set up certain boundaries about that part of my life in order to be able to fulfill the call that God has in my life. And the same thing you're going to have to do. So you might be on the other end saying, I need a mentor. Don't, be, don't assume that the mentor, it's about quantity. It's, about, it's, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. And then if you find ways to connect with them, make sure you come prepared. Make sure you find ways to add value. Maybe come into their lane or their space so you can make that connection. And don't just be a dump truck. Make sure you're a doer. And don't ever stop it. I still do it. I pick out two new guys every single year. I spend my money. I fly. I find out what they like. I send them gift cards and checks. And so I've, I, two, I pick two new people that I'm going to go learn from every single year. I fly to their place with questions and to bless them. And so don't ever, don't ever stop it either. And I was going to say something real quick over here. Oh, um, I'm Derek's wife, Stacy. Um, I was going to say, we, we each Take have notes, a... everybody. Take notes, please. <laughs> um, we each have a responsibility to, um, you know, grow ourselves. It is not my mentor's responsibility to grow me. It's my responsibility. So in this day and age, there is way more access to having... Uh, mentors that are like global leaders because of social media, because of podcasts, whatever. All three of those guys have mentors that they don't, other than the ones that they have, like Pastor Chris, that they have the 30 minutes every other month or whatever. They're growing from John Maxwell and Andy Stanley and books and podcasts and that kind of thing. So you got to feed your spirit because then when you go to the human mentor that you have face to face time or FaceTime to FaceTime, um, you actually have the questions that you want to ask about, like, how can I do this better? How can I do this better? That you've heard from maybe somebody else, right. but you're using the human interaction for the questions that you really need the human, inter inter human interaction for. So make sure you're feeding yourself through other people so that when you do get that mentor, you can um, make the most value of that in-person time. Can we give it up for him? Thank you. Thank you, guys.